This just in. Police are on the lookout for a dangerous escaped convict. He is reported to have a hook on his right arm where his hand once was. If you see this person, please do not approach him. Call the police and get out of the area. I repeat, do not approach this dangerous person. I can't believe he's really gone. It's been three years, but that night still haunts me. Steve and I went out to celebrate our two-year anniversary of dating. We had a delicious dinner at a restaurant I had been wanting to go to for a while. It was a special night, not only because it was our anniversary, but he finally popped the question. We were so happy and so in love. Our drive home took us through a secluded wooded area. There was nothing and nobody around for a couple miles. Suddenly, the car started sputtering. Steve pulled over to the side of the road. According to the gas gauge, we were not out of gas, so he got out and checked under the hood. Suddenly, an alert came across the radio. This just in. Police are on the lookout for a dangerous escaped convict. He is reported to have a hook on his right arm where his hand once was. If you see this person, do not approach him. Call 911 right away and leave the area. I repeat, do not approach this dangerous person. The alert was just finishing up when Steve got back in the car. What was that? He asked. I just stared straight ahead at the open hood. Sweetie, what's wrong? said Steve. Snapping out of my shock from hearing such a terrifying thing, I said, They just had an alert come across about a dangerous escape inmate with a hook on his right hand wandering around the area somewhere. We should get out of here. Is the car okay? I didn't see anything wrong. Let me try to start it again, he said. Steve turned the ignition. The engine started and then sputtered again before shutting down. I don't know what's wrong. We have power, so it's not the battery, he said, looking at his phone. And I don't have any cell signal out here. I grabbed my phone out of my purse. Sure enough, I didn't have any service either. I don't either. What are we going to do? Just wait here till morning and hope somebody drives by? Steve took a moment to kiss me. When he broke the kiss, he said, Calm down, baby. Everything will be okay. I'm going to walk the couple miles back to the last house we saw. You stay here in case someone drives by. I won't be long. Maybe I'll get signal on the way and won't have to walk all the way. No, you can't leave me out here alone with that maniac running around, I yelled at him. Listen, it will be okay. I probably won't have to go that far before I get signal and can call for assistance. Just make sure to lock the doors and lay down in the back seat. I will be back as quick as possible. You will be okay, I promise. Besides, the crazy man is probably still on the other side of town, not far from the hospital, hiding. Knowing we really didn't have much choice, I sighed and said, Okay, just walk a little ways till you get your signal. If nothing, after walking about 15 minutes, come back and we can go together in the daylight. Okay, that'll work. I'll be back soon. Love you, and don't forget to keep the doors locked. Don't get out for anything, understood? Steve said. Yes, honey, be careful and hurry back. I love you too. Steve got out of the car and I locked the doors and lay down in the back seat and waited. I didn't know how this happened, but somehow I fell asleep. Guess I was exhausted from all the excitement that day. I woke up to banging on the car window just at dawn. 
Jumping up, I saw it was the police. I thought to myself, where's Steve? He should have been back hours ago. I unlocked the door and began to open it when the officer told me to stay where I was. I just sat there, waiting and watching the police, not sure why so many were there for just a broken down car. One of the officers came over and opened my door. He helped me out, but told me not to look behind us. I listened and slowly got out of the car. When we got to where the other officers were standing, I chanced a quick look behind me. To my horror, there was Steve, hanging upside down above the car, suspended by a hook. I don't remember much after that. It must have been the shock, but most days it feels like it was just a nightmare. As for the psychomaniac killer with a hook for a hand, they never caught him. Every time I hear about another hook murder, I remember Steve and the beautiful dinner and evening we had, which ended in horror. The Hookman legends have been around for decades with many different versions that sometimes have nothing to do with the hook, but simply a serial killer who targets teens in a secluded area. The origins of this classic legend, as well as similar ones like Lover's Lane and The Boyfriend, is not entirely known, but it is speculated that the story began circulating sometime in the 1950s with the first known publication of the story on November 8, 1960, when a letter to Dear Abby, a popular advice column, was printed. Dear Abby, if you are interested in teenagers, you will print the story. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it doesn't matter because it served its purpose for me. A fellow and his date pulled into their favorite lover's lane to listen to the radio and do a little necking. The music was interrupted by an announcer who said there was an escaped convict in the area who had served time for rape and robbery. He was described as having a hook instead of a right hand. The couple became frightened and drove away. When the boy took the girl home, he went around to open the car door for her. Then, he saw a hook on the door handle. I will never park and make out as long as I live. I hope this does the same for other kids. Jeanette. Although this letter was published in 1960, many believe the story goes back further than that to the mysterious moonlight murders of Texarkana. Texarkana is a small town that straddles the state line between Texas and Arkansas that in 1946 was terrorized by a killer. Today, more than 75 years later, it remains unsolved. The Moonlight Murders consisted of a series of unsolved serial murders and other violent crimes that was committed that spring around the Texarkana region and attributed to an unidentified serial killer known as the Phantom Killer or Phantom Slayer. These horrific attacks occurred over a 10-week period from February 1946 to May 1946. The Phantom, as described by witnesses, was wearing a white mask or sack with holes cut out for eyes. The first attack occurred on February 22, 1946. Jimmy Hollis and his girlfriend Mary Jean Leary were parked on a secluded road known as Lover's Lane. After a few minutes, a man wearing a white cloth mask, like a pillowcase with eye holes cut out, came to the driver's side door and shined a flashlight in their window. Thinking it was some sort of prank, Jimmy told the man he had the wrong person. The man responded by saying, I don't want to kill you, fellow. Just do as I say. He ordered Jimmy and Mary out of the car on the driver's side and told Jimmy to take his pants off. When Jimmy did what the assailant said, he was hit twice in the head with the butt of the gun. 
Mary thought the man wanted to rob them and showed him Jimmy's wallet. That earned her a hit in the head as well. The man then ordered her to stand and run up the road. While running away, Mary saw an old car parked off the side of the road and tried to hide. The assailant found her and asked her why she was running. She told him that he told her to. The assailant then called her a liar and knocked her down and sexually assaulted her with the barrel of the gun. When the man left, she ran about a half a mile to the nearby house and called the police. Meanwhile, Jimmy regained consciousness and flagged down a passing car. Within 30 minutes, the police arrived, but the attacker was nowhere to be found. Mary was hospitalized overnight for minor injuries, and Jimmy spent several days in the hospital recovering from a fractured skull. Both Jimmy and Mary gave conflicting reports of their attacker. Mary said she could see under the mask, and his face was of a light-skinned African-American. But Jimmy claimed he was a tanned white man around 30 years old. Both did claim that they could not discern his features because they were blinded by the flashlight, but he was about six feet tall. The next attack occurred on March 24, 1946, and was the first double murder. Richard Griffin and his girlfriend, Polly Ann Moore, were found dead that Sunday morning about 100 yards south of U.S. Highway 67 West by a passing motorist. Richard was found in the car in the front seat on his knees with his head resting on his hands, his pockets turned inside out. Polly Ann was face down on the back seat. Blood pulled outside of the car suggests that she was placed in the car after being shot and killed on a blanket that was also found outside on the ground. Richard had been shot twice in the car. Both victims had gunshot wounds on the back of their heads and were fully clothed. A 32 cartridge casing was also found at the scene. While it was rumored that Polly Ann was sexually assaulted, modern reports refute this claim. On Sunday, April 14, 1946, Paul Martin picked up Betty Jo Booker from a musical performance at the local VFW around 1.30 a.m. The next morning, around 6.30 a.m., Paul's body was found by the northern edge of North Park Road. He had been shot four times. Betty Jo's body was discovered around 11.30 that morning, two miles away from where Paul's body was found. She was fully clothed, with her right hand in the pocket of her coat. Betty Jo had been shot two times. The weapon used was the same as the first double murder. On Friday, May 3, 1946, sometime around 9.30 p.m., Virgil Starks and his wife Katie were on their farm about 10 miles northeast of Texarkana. Virgil was sitting in his armchair reading the paper when he was shot twice in the back of the head through the window. When Katie heard the breaking glass, she came running from the other room and saw her husband stand up then slumped back into his chair. Realizing something was very wrong, she ran to the phone and called the police. While trying to make the call, she was shot in the face from the same window. Katie regained her footing and attempted to get their gun from the other room, but was blinded by her own blood. When she heard the killer at the back of the house, she ran out the front door barefoot across the street to her sister's house. No one was home there, so she then ran to the neighbors before collapsing. The neighbor took Katie to the hospital where the sheriff's deputy met them and questioned her in the operating room. While the phantom killer was on the loose, the small town of Texarkana was a city under siege. 
Residents armed themselves and curfews were put in place. In spite of the Texas Rangers' involvement, no conclusive arrests were made in the connection with the Moonlight murders. But over 400 people were temporarily held in possible connection with the killings throughout the investigation. Theories spread that the phantom killer was some sort of sex maniac because he was targeting couples and the lack of other identifiable evidence. Many people began to believe that Val Sweeney, who was arrested in 1947 for auto theft, was the phantom. His wife even confessed to it at the time, but by law, she was not able to testify against her husband. She later refuted her confession, but Sweeney remained in prison as a habitual offender until 1973. He died in 1994 without ever implicating himself in the murders. Over 75 years later, the Phantom Killer's identity remains a mystery, and the town he terrorized has never been the same. Most towns usually try to forget such a gruesome history, but in Texarkana, they embraced it. When the movie The Town That Dreaded Sundown was filmed here in 1976, many of the locals were cast as extras, and every year around Halloween, the movie is shown at Spring Lake Park near where one of the murders happened. The Phantom Killer of Texarkana is not the only killers that seem to target Lover's Lane. There are at least seven others, including the Zodiac Killer, Son of Sam Killer, and the Monster of Florence. Some of these also still remain unsolved. We want to give a special shout out to our member, Flightless Mew One. Thank you. 